Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum, Cadence Independent Media Production. Today, we are going to work through a handful of commonly overlooked aspects of tuning and drum sounds. Over the many years that we've been here talking about tuning, tensioning, drum sounds, all of that, we've run into several different things both in the comments and just in our personal travels where we got surprised by solutions to issues that we were having with the sound of a drum. Sometimes these are tuning issues, sometimes they're not tuning issues, but they seem like they should be, and we want to talk about that today too. We're going to give time to the snare drum, the toms, and the bass drum today, and we're going to start out with the snare. Let's hear the sound of the snare as it stands today. First up, it definitely sounds like a snare drum. However, there are some things going on in here that are definitely not what I'm looking for in an open, healthy, happy snare drum sound. Setting aside the feel of the stick on the drum, I'm getting a lot of residual snare noise in the decay of the drum, and also I'm not getting the kind of articulation that I'd like to have in the center when I play things a little bit quieter. The first thing that a lot of people would think of is that there needs to be some adjustment to the tuning. Maybe the snare side head is too tight, maybe the batter head is too loose, and they just dive into it with a drum key. A very practical place to go at this juncture would be to add tension to the snare wires by dialing them tighter with the snare mechanism. Let's hear what happens when we move through some tensions to get rid of this residual noise. We no longer have the wildness and the decay, but at the same time, now the drum is extremely choked, especially at lower dynamics. At this point, it basically only sounds good to me when I'm hitting it pretty aggressively, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but I definitely want to be able to use the entire dynamic range of the drum at any time. If you listen closely, you'll also hear that the actual tone, the note of the drum, is getting squashed out of it because of how tight those wires are. The snare side head can't breathe or move at all. If we take a moment to flip the drum over, the culprit becomes obvious right away. The straps that are holding the wires onto the bottom of the drum are not mounted squarely in the mechanism on either end, which means that when we apply tension to these wires, one side of the wires is much tighter than the other. This is not an issue exclusive to straps, though I've run into it more often with straps than not. What this means for us is that as we move through different tensions with the wires, we're always going to have some that are too loose and some that are too tight, which means we're going to be experiencing both choking and wildness in the wires for the duration of the possibilities. The straps on these wires actually have markings on them that help us to align them squarely in the mechanisms. And once we've done that, listen to how it sounds now.
pretty much every drum that I've ever gotten new from a store, whether it was low end or high end, that utilized straps did not have them quite squarely in the mechanism. And the more off they are, the more dramatic this is going to be. So it's really worth looking. Honestly, whether you're having a dramatic issue or not with your drum, just check and make sure that they're mounted squarely on there because if they are square, it's only gonna get better than what you already have. This particular issue has garnered more solutions than any other thing I have ever seen on the internet. And everything from uh, making the snare side head tabletop tight to releasing tension on the tension rods that are adjacent to the wires to putting cotton balls in the snare drum or adding tons of muffling to even putting tape underneath the wires on the snare side head. But the fact of the matter is that what we really want is just to have even tension on the wires when they're engaged. This means that the drum can function as designed, the wires can work with the drum, and we can use the entire range of tensions on the wires. Moving on to the bass drum, everybody out there has a prescription for what they think is the right way to tension a bass drum head, how much muffling to use, where to put it, all of that. First off, let's hear how this bass drum sounds right now. It's not the worst, but there's a few things going on in there that wouldn't necessarily lay in a groove. It's not as punchy or tight as it could be, and some of the low end is getting lost. Additionally, we are hearing some racket in there that sounds almost like there's a distortion pedal on there or something like that. A little crunchy, a little bit of more sustain in the higher frequencies. Not necessarily what we're looking for. Now, the surprising thing is there's a pillow in here right now. And something as simple as reorienting that pillow and making small adjustments to it can completely change the character of this drum. Let's make a little bit of an adjustment to it, change the way that it's pressing against the heads and see how this sounds. Where we are now is a little less pressure against the batter head and a little more pressure against the rezzo head. The rezzo head on the bass drum is actually, to me, the most overlooked thing on the entire drum set where it comes to tone. And we need to think about how much tension we put on there and even more importantly, what if any muffling is getting applied to it. When it comes to muffling, oftentimes we think of it as a binary thing. Either it's muffled or it's not, particularly with the bass drum and the prevalence of heavily muffled bass drums in the last few generations of music. Never forget that a little and a lot do completely different things, whether it's a snare drum or a bass drum. So try other options in there because there may be something better for the music you're making than what you have right now. Now, let's take a look at these toms. Before we even talk about it, hear how they sound right now. These toms have definitely sounded better. They're usable in this condition, but we definitely wanna make some adjustments and this is gonna be a tuning issue. Where we're at right now is we've followed, let's say a prescription that says that we need to have a specific interval between the two heads on the toms. And for our drums, it's not working. We are not getting the sound that we're looking for and we need to make some adjustments. And if we stop at the idea that someone told us this is the right interval and call it a day, maybe even consider that there's something wrong with us or there's something wrong with our drums, then all is lost. The thing to take away from this right now is that we need to get away from the idea that a prescription for a 12 inch tom or a 16 inch tom is gonna give us a specific sound and understand that we need to uh, make adjustments, particularly in this case to the resonant heads, to get a sound that is working for these drums with these heads and particularly in this room. This is where the difference between a recipe versus a methodology comes into play. A recipe, you make it, you get the end result, and either you like it or you don't. And 
that's kind of the end of it. However, with a methodology where we go step by step with the hopes of having a positive goal at the end and hopefully taking notes along the way, we can end up with our own recipe that we can make adjustments to later as needed. Now we've made some adjustments, let's hear how they sound. The specifics to what was changed in terms of the tuning is not so much the important part here, the specific interval or the specific notes that we have. What's important is that I sat down at them, I didn't like them, and I made little adjustments until I was happy with the sound. Now here's the surprising thing. These drums themselves, the heads top and bottom, are not in tune with themselves. They're close, but they're not perfect. If you're a person who agonizes over whether or not every single lug is exactly the same on each of the heads, there's a version of things where you don't necessarily have to do that if what we're looking for is just a pleasing sound that helps us make the music we wanna make. Let's hear these lugs on the 12. The surprising thing <laughs> I'm going to tell you now is that the heads were in tune with themselves in the first demo where the sound was frustrating and we weren't happy with it, which means that having a hierarchy of what's most important and rigidly adhering to that is not necessarily going to get us the result that we're looking for. At the end of the day, we want the drums to make a sound that makes us happy and whatever it takes to get there is what we need to do. And throwing recipes out the window and using our ears and taking the time is a much more functional way of getting us there. What we're really talking about here is problem solving in the context of fixing a drum sound that we're frustrated with or going after one that we have in our heads that we want to use for whatever it is that we're doing. Getting away from the idea that we can purchase a solution or have someone just tell us a solution and have that ultimately just do the thing and we can abscond from learning along the way and training our ears and training our minds about the sounds we want. We have to throw that away. We have to make sure that we understand the results of the adjustments that we're making and not rely on outside forces to tell us what's right and wrong because none of this is ultimately right and wrong. It's just about whether or not you like it. Just like we practice playing, this too takes practice. It takes concerted practice and focus, but over that time now, you can sit down at a drum and say, oh, I hear that the wires aren't on there squarely. Flip it over and they're not on there squarely, you can fix it, save all that time of wondering if it's the batter head or wondering if you need to buy a new drum head or something like that, and go down the list first, solve the problems quickly, and get back to the business of making music. We also want to tack on a little bonus moment here. There's a lot of comments that will say the following. So-and-so tunes their snare side head as tight as it'll go, and if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Case closed, slam the door, never think about it again. And when we talk to these so-and-sos and say things like, why don't you try tuning it down a little bit and see if you like the sound? They do it and they say they hate it, but the thing that they forget is that if you crank up a snare side head for a week, maybe even just a day, and then try to tune it low, the tension is lost and it's gonna sound bad. So if you are one of the devotees out there of the tabletop tight snare side head and your experimentations have not led you to a good sound, please consider getting a fresh snare side head and experimenting with even just medium tension on that side just to see what it gets you. It might get you something cool, you may still hate it, it's totally fine, but this is one instance where actually replacing this piece of equipment on your drum, it's actually necessary to really know what it's capable of. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this today, please follow the link below to the Patreon. There's a lot of opportunities there to help us continue to make this program. We have a lot of fun doing this and being part of the community that's grown around it. Check it out, see if there's a place for you in there. There's also some extra content, a lot of it actually. And as always, like, comment, subscribe, and do let us know 
any solutions that you have stumbled on where you thought you needed to fix it one way and discovered that it was something completely different. 